In this video, I share the five books that shaped my political and economic worldview. Any learning journey is as rewarding as it is demanding, especially if it ends up challenging notions and beliefs cultivated by one's formal education, cultural upbringing, and even lived experiences. That's part of the joy of independent learning, but it can also be kind of a painful process. But hopefully, it's a process that never ends. So to be clear what this list is all about, it's a selection of five books that completely altered my perspective and blew my mind. A couple will be very familiar, and others I feel are kind of specific to my journey and just happened to come at the right time based upon what was happening in my life and the world around me. Now, if you've read any or all of these books, let me know in the comments what you think of them and if they played a similar role in your life. And if you haven't read them, I truly hope that you'll make the time and that they light up your brains as much as they lit up mine. I'll leave a link in the description to purchase them in the UNFTR store on bookshop.org. And remember, if you're going to order any of them, don't go to Amazon. Help support independent bookstores and authors by setting up an account at bookshop.org. With that behind us, here's the list. Coming in hot at number one on the charts is The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, authored by Michelle Alexander. The New Jim Crow was published in 2010 and made the rounds in black cultural circles before rocketing into the mainstream consciousness. It's a seminal work that delves into the complex and deeply rooted issue of systemic racism in the United States, especially focusing on how mass incarceration has effectively created a racial underclass. Published during the Obama administration that was supposed to be America entering into the post-racialized era, the book pummeled this notion and grappled with America's discriminatory past and demonstrated how the bonds of enslavement never really left the structures and systems of power in our nation. Michelle Alexander gives a sobering and detailed account of how the war on drugs disproportionately targeted black and brown Americans, resulting in mass incarceration that has had devastating effects on black communities. She argues that the U.S. criminal justice system functions as a contemporary racial caste system akin to the Jim Crow laws of the past, which legally enforced racial segregation and disenfranchisement. The book outlines how policies and practices in law enforcement, judicial proceedings, and sentencing have systematically marginalized African Americans especially. And she provides compelling evidence that black men in particular have been arrested, convicted, and incarcerated at disproportionately high rates for drug offenses, despite showing that people of all races use and sell drugs at similar rates. She emphasizes that these racial disparities are not accidental, but are the result of deliberate policies and practices that target people of color. Now, what I loved about this book is that it's not emotional or patronizing in any way. It's a clinical deep dive into cause and effect. It's just as uncomfortable as it is eye-opening because it's written so clearly and almost scientifically while maintaining a fluid narrative tone that engages the reader throughout. When it was at its peak of popularity, black friends of mine said that it was useful and effective because it kind of explained the root causes of issues in such brutal detail that it was almost comforting even if it didn't tell them anything they didn't already know from lived experience. For white readers like myself that weren't taught any of this in school or live in a world without daily exposure to structural racism, it was groundbreaking and foundational. I'm not sure I would have had the tools to dig into other aspects of structural and economic racism if not for this book. Next up is Death of the Liberal Class by Chris Hedges. Now this one was also published in 2010 and it too made me really uncomfortable. What's notable, and perhaps specific to my experience with both this book and the new Jim Crow, is the timing of their releases. So we're two years into the financial crisis and just past the honeymoon phase of the Obama administration. And things really aren't getting any better. In fact, Occupy Wall Street would explode just the following year, and I'm really grateful that I had both of these books under my belt to experience that moment in time. Death of the liberal class annihilates the liberal establishment in the United States. I mean absolutely demolishes it. And it kind of wrecked me. A little context for why I think it had such a profound impact on me is because the timing really matters. As listeners to the UNFTR podcast know, I grew up in a Republican household. I was a registered Republican throughout my 20s and early 30s, and even ran for local office once as a Republican. Something my now adult kids still can't wrap their minds around, because all they know is that daddy's kind of a socialist. Anyway, 
The scales started to fall away from my eyes during the Bush years, and the financial crisis pulled me past the middle of what I would consider center-left. So I was one of those who rejoiced upon Obama's election, and I also happened to be writing a lot at the time. There's something about the act of writing that disciplines the mind more than any other form of visual or auditory learning. And I found that I was often coming to what I considered to be radical conclusions on certain topics that were anathema to my upbringing. As disillusionment began to set in with the Obama administration's corporatism, prosecution of the war on terror, and attack on civil liberties, I was having kind of a crisis of conscience. There was no going back to my conservative roots, but I was over on the center left being like, what the fuck is even happening now? And then I read Death of the Liberal Class and started following Chris Hedges, who would himself become somewhat of a sensation during the Occupy days that followed. Anyway, Death of the Liberal Class traces the history of the liberal class, which historically included academics, clergy, journalists, labor leaders, and members of the Democratic Party, and its role in challenging the excesses of the corporate state. Now, Hedges contends that these institutions once acted as a counterbalance to unchecked capitalism and militarism, striving to protect the rights of workers, minorities, and the poor. However, over time, this class was ultimately co-opted by the very forces it was supposed to oppose. The book paints a rather bleak picture of the current state of American society, where the collapse of the liberal class has left a void that has been filled by corporate power and authoritarian tendencies. Now, since this book came out, I've read a number of Hedges' works, and I still follow him, though I don't always agree with his tear-it-all-down-and-take-it-to-the-streets rhetoric. Having said that, he's one of the brightest intellectual minds in our modern and shallow society, and I'll always consider his take, especially since he has the reporting bona fides to back up his perspective. As a former war correspondent, he's seen some things, and he knows what political and societal failure looks like and can lead to. So I always heed his words of caution, even if I remain slightly more optimistic about the world. So this one is probably on a lot of lists. A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Alert, super basic white guy reference coming up. When Matt Damon's character in A Good Will Hunting says People's History of the United States by Zinn would knock your socks off, and the Robin Williams character counters with manufacturing consent by Noam Chomsky, white liberals on college campuses could be seen spontaneously combusting throughout the Northeast. Because history is written by the victors, it's what we're taught in schools, and how structures of power perpetuate. And so it is said, and so it is written. So when Howard Zinn set out to write a book from the perspective of those who oppose the mainstream narrative and provide an alternative telling of our history, it sent shockwaves through academia and eventually wound up in the liberal and left mainstream. These days, it's lost a bit of its radical hold on our consciousness, so it's difficult to explain to people how mind-blowing this was for a generation of disillusioned leftists. Although, as someone who came to it post 9-11, it still packed a knockout punch, so there's no question it stands the test of time. So Zinn's central thesis is that American history, often portrayed as a steady march toward freedom and democracy, is in fact a history of conflict, exploitation, and resistance. He argues that the dominant narratives of American history have been shaped by the interests of the ruling elite, politicians, industrialists, and other powerful figures who have often used rhetoric about democracy and liberty to justify the expansion of their own power and wealth, frequently at the expense of ordinary people. So the book begins with the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the Americas and the subsequent decimation of indigenous populations. There's no question that he's one of the reasons that Columbus lost status in modern society. From there, he moves through key periods in American history, including the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Industrial Revolution, and the Civil Rights Movement, always emphasizing the perspectives of those who were most affected by these events. Now, one of my favorite parts of the book is the firsthand accounts of the Berrigan brothers, priests during the Civil Rights era that not only bucked the government, they bucked the church. And over time, the book has been both celebrated and criticized for its unapologetically leftist perspective. But there's no question that it had a profound effect on left movements and helped millions of people think differently about American imperial exploits. This one is like the band that you grew up listening to before it was cool, so you felt like the cool kid when you were listening to it. And then one of their songs crossed over and everyone started loving on your band and then it made you all like, I was on that forever ago. That's kind of how I felt 
when Jeff Charlotte's 2008 book, The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, positively blew my mind. So Charlotte was an investigative reporter, still a great writer, and he went undercover into a secretive Christian organization known as The Family, or The Fellowship, and exposed how the group operated for decades behind the scenes to influence political and corporate power in the United States, and in some cases, in other parts of the world. Eventually, the book got its own series on Netflix in 2019, bringing his incredible work to a much wider audience. So he begins by recounting his own experience living at Ivanwald, a communal house in Arlington, Virginia, where young men are groomed for leadership within the family. This experience provided him with a unique insider's perspective on the group's operations and ideology. He describes the family as an elite, male-dominated network that espouses a radical form of Christian fundamentalism. This form of Christianity isn't concerned with traditional evangelical practices like preaching or proselytizing, but focuses instead on cultivating relationships with the powerful under the belief that they are chosen by God to lead. So the fundamental idea behind the family's teachings is that if you are powerful in this life, you've already been chosen by Jesus. There's no need to go through all that pesky poverty and good deeds stuff. You've done that maybe, I guess, in a past life. So your job now is to take control of the levers of power to spread this bizarre gospel of Jesus Christ to other powerful people around the world. One way the family leveraged relationships to shape U.S. domestic and foreign policy is through its annual National Prayer Breakfast, an event attended by U.S. presidents, members of Congress, and international dignitaries. Charlotte uncovered how the family's influence extended into several administrations, both Democratic and Republican, and how its members have been involved in some of the most critical and controversial decisions in American politics. The family traces the history of this particular brand of fundamentalism back to its roots, when evangelical preachers roamed the countryside all the way through to when Christianity got a makeover in the Depression to portray Christ as a capitalist and combat the socialist-style policies and movements that were beginning to take hold. And that it follows the movement through to its zenith as a powerful organization under the leadership of Doug Coe, a shadowy figure that simultaneously took the group underground with no trace of it, no records, no minutes of meetings or public doctrines, while it maneuvered deftly through the halls of Congress and through to the highest echelon of power in the world. So when you pair the family with other books like um, Democracy in Chains by Nancy McLean, which is worthy of an honorable mention here, it really helps explain how the far-right Christian nationalist movement was normalized in our society and how it took hold of the levers of power in our politics. And now, last but not least, number five. So this one is a bit of an outlier because it's the most difficult and dense read of the group and probably requires some baseline understanding or at least an interest in modern economic theory to really appreciate. So here's the TLDR backstory for what makes the illusion of free markets, punishment, and the myth of natural order by Bernard Hardcourt so instrumental in my personal learning journey and why I refer back to it often. Toward the end of World War II, the greatest economic minds in the world gathered at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire to essentially create a new economic world order from the ashes of the Second Great War. The result was a new Keynesian monetary system that provided balance and stability to the world economy, though it was very clearly tilted in the, in the favor of the United States, the emerging superpower on the international stage. But for the next 25 years, the Western economies did rebuild themselves, and under this model, enjoyed really great prosperity and stability. The stagflation crisis in the 1970s gave birth to a new economic modality now referred to as neoliberalism under the influence of economic giants in the Mont Pelerin society such as Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. Say it loud, say it with me, yo, Milton Friedman. For the balance of the past 50 years or so, this is the model that much of the world has operated on, or perhaps more bluntly, been subjected to. The underlying belief system that fuels neoliberalism is the belief that the free market is the most efficient, fair, and productive force in the world. So long as we allow nearly everything in economic and political life to be guided by the force of the free market, the invisible hand, the world will be a prosperous and even egalitarian society. Now, the first quarter or so of the book is a bit of a slog because Harcourt goes full-on academic to establish a framework for understanding market fundamentals, and it can be a bit pedantic. But once your ear is trained to the language and you begin to wrap your mind around market concepts, 
Harcourt expands his argument and so thoroughly dismantles the fundamentals of neoliberalism and exposes the fatal flaws of its thinking. The book also draws a parallel between the rise of the free market ideology and the growth of the modern penal system. I don't think I could appreciate the writings of anarchists and syndicalists throughout history if I hadn't read this book. Harcourt's argument here is that the state has retreated from regulating the economy in favor of laissez-faire principles. It has also simultaneously expanded its role in regulating and punishing individuals, especially through the criminal justice system. So this shift, he suggests, reflects a deeper ideological commitment to maintaining social order through punishment rather than through economic regulation. Essentially, that the preservation of private property rights supersedes personal liberty and freedoms. Throughout the book, Harcourt thoroughly debunks the notion of, quote, natural order, which suggests that both markets and social hierarchies are self-regulating and just. He shows that the very concept of natural order is nothing more than a powerful myth that's been used to legitimize both economic inequality and the expansion of the penal state. Like I said, this one is different from others in that I think it requires some baseline understanding of different economic systems and frameworks, but since one of my great obsessions is the power and influence of neoliberal thinking over the past half century, this book specifically gave me the language to more fully understand the totality and danger of the neoliberal ideology. So there you go. The five books that most influenced my personal learning journey and my worldview on politics and economics. Obviously, I want to know your thoughts if you've read any of these books and if they made it onto your lists. And while we're talking about it, let me know what your top five are. Just list them in the comments section below and let's see if we can get a little book club going here. Don't forget that you can find links to all of these books in the description below. And before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps our work get discovered and it doesn't cost a dime. Another thing that doesn't cost a dime, by the way, is our free weekly newsletter featuring original content, links to must read articles vetted by our crew, a chart of the week on topical economic matters, and a progressive spotlight and progressive resources. So go to unftr.com to find links to all the things. And we'll see you soon.